Okay, on this episode, we're going to work on the camera blocking on a sci-fi short by a New York director. And helping us is Mark Horowitz, who's executive producer and director of NCIS on CBS. Now, Mark is an extremely experienced director, and this episode contains a big lesson in how to think about camera work. Because many people just go straight to looking for cool shots. But something amazing happens when you take the time to work out the characters and the conflict first, and Mark shows just how seriously to take that. So we spend something like 45 minutes on the characters before we put in any cameras. And while this seems a bit tedious and nitpicky at first, it's pretty incredible how the blocking all of a sudden works itself out, because we suddenly know why to make every choice. And this is such a perfect example of all the things you get for free when you understand the characters. I'm truly thankful to Mark for taking the time to share from his vast experience that comes from directing a long-running TV show. And I'm excited for you to see someone at the top of their game just work on a scene. Because no textbook beats just watching people work and seeing how they think. Some of the things you should get out of this is first of all seeing where you can do better. Mark is incredibly good at spotting interesting things happening between the characters. And that's such a key thing to be good at because it's what informs all of the camera work and directing. This should also show you all the ways in which your work is not fundamentally different from someone at the top of the industry. Because every scene is new, and it just takes a while to figure it out. And it's the same for everyone. Make sure to download the script in the description, and then let's do the show. So on the episode today is Nikhil Kamkulkar, a New York-based writer and director known for films like Leaving Priyanka and Indian Cowboy. And joining us is Mark Horowitz, executive producer and director of NCIS. And he previously produced Doogie Howser, MD, and JAG. Prep Show is brought to you by Hollywood Camera Work. Check out Directing Actors, a huge course that teaches you how to create strong and deep performances. So what a super honor, Mark, for you to be on the show. So this is Mark Horowitz, who is going to help Nikhil basically work out the, the, the blocking for a sci-fi short that he's written here and is hoping to actually shoot as a lockdown short. And I am so interested because um, Mark has kind of uh, some, some good cl classical insights about how to approach a scene to not just jump into cool angles, but to, to work out what's going on inside of the scene. And so... In this episode here, I'm going to try to interfere uh, less than I usually do, and then I just really want to see wh how you do what you do, Mark. Oh, please, please interfere as much as possible, because because <laughs> uh, and everything I'm going to say here is you know is is just something that has developed over a period of time that works for me. And as you know, and as we both know, and and Nikhil, you're a very experienced director, you and you're you're the writer of the scene, so you have tremendous knowledge about what's going on. Um, I just find that if I don't do these steps that we're going to talk about, that I get to a place where you're just not, you're just not digging as deep as you could. And the, and, and those little moments that we sort of find those, that the, the more subtext that we can get out of uh, the scene, uh, just the clearer things get uh, for the actors. And, and, and then the staging and the block and hap happens naturally. It becomes much less forced. So everything I say, you know, like I said, it's simply my opinion and, and I, uh, uh, you know, you take or, or leave anything. That, uh, should we, should we, for context, just have Nikhil explain the scene or just like the major yes, piece in yes, the scene? Yes, yes, yes. Because they don't, people, the people at home don't get a chance to read this in advance, right? I don't know. I mean, uh, we'll talk about whether there will be a link in the description. Yeah, we could, we could, we could hand it out to them. First of all, Mark, uh, thank you so much. I was sort of sitting quietly without protest as you called me an experienced director, but you, sir, are the experienced director. <laughs> uh, I am just here to really sort of, you know, learn from you and uh, understand what your approach is uh, and make it, you know, part of my process. And, um, you know, I'm still evolving my process as a director. I certainly don't have it locked down, uh, but I absolutely and completely hear you when you say that we need to dig deeper into the scene to really find out what's happening um, uh, between the characters and, and with the characters 
before we jump into sort of the blocking and the visual and the composition and everything else. Uh, so in this particular uh, short film, uh, Holden and Jane are on and off lovers uh, in the New York milieu. We don't get a lot of backstory about either of them. We don't really get a lot of their ordinary life in this particular short. Uh, but the idea is that the short film starts off when Jane comes to meet Holden suddenly for their one year anniversary. Uh, but what happens in that on that night, uh, on that eventful night, is that she confronts him with the fact that he's already married. So in this confrontation, um, what happens is that Jane gets Holden to ultimately reveal uh, what has happened with his now missing wife, um, that nobody seems to know where she is and what has happened with her. So that's sort of the journey of the scene. Uh, and um, there's a revelation at the end, and maybe we shouldn't talk about that right now, but I think... Yeah, you should. Yeah, I mean, that's it's where... It, it's part of the thought process, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, you can reveal it. It'll ruin it for everybody. No, don't who watches say anything. It. Don't, don't tell Are you, I mean, but, hmm, I mean, can we block that and keep it a secret? What yes, it is? that's the point. Okay, the all right, I'll, I'll roll with you. That's cool. With, com with the complete truthfulness of what the audience is experiencing, and mm -hmm. then the, the more true that is, the more real that is, when you get to the turn... The audience then has all of the fun of going back through in their minds and thinking about all these moments that took place before. And when all of that is correct, as if it were really happening in real time, then everything will, then everything feels satisfying. Should Are we talking about trying to avoid here on the episode men, uh, explaining what the big uh, turn at the end is? No, I was going to wait till a little bit. A later. little bit later. Okay, okay, okay. We'll we'll hold the suspense. There, there is a major turn uh, coming up oh, here. Go ahead. I mean, let's, uh, let's okay. talk. Okay, whatever. Go ahead. I'm always trying to, you know, I'm I'm a secret keeper, so you know. But I, you know, I, you just don't want to let that influence. Exactly. I I think that's the, the other. I, I think we go through the journey. With the characters, go and let's, through the uh, characters, and then and then all of that will. That's what's so much fun about this scene. As I said to you before, it's a wonderful scene. If 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 I was given this scene to direct, I would. I, I did. I read it and I thought, oh, I'd like, I'd like to direct this scene because it has wonderful nuance, great uh, opportunities for the actors to explore very tiny moments, and um, the deeper that. I think you're able to dig into this, the more fulfilling it's going to be for everyone involved in it, including the audience. So I'm just going to sort of lay out my little process. And this is pretty old fashioned stuff. This is not, I haven't invented anything here. It's just something that sort of, I, I found if I do these things and it is more time consuming, everything I'm going to talk about on the front end, Mm. than it is to sit down with shot designer and say, okay, there's two people in the room. One's over here in the kitchen. One's on the couch. I'm going to have a master here. Then we're going to do some overs. They're going to come over to the table. We can do that all day long, but, but you're, but you're, but you're not going to, you're not going to be surprised by anything doing that. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do, and, and, and this is sort of, I think it's really based uh, even more on the, on the English method of dramatic teaching, which is to use the text as the source of, of all motivation and information to define in the text both what each character wants and how they're feeling. And, and I do this for every character in every scene. Uh, what is their motivation and what is their emotion? And I pick and I try and, and, and um, whittle it down to as few words as possible. So if we were to take that and and apply it as we go through the scene, starting out with Holden, have, having, and of course, people at home need to read the scene to really follow along with what I'm saying. Um, uh, yes. Um, so what what uh, Jane confronts Holden with uh, is the um, is the fact that she's discovered that he's already married and he's uh, that he's been married and is still legally married to a woman called Priyanka. Uh, and I think what um, what Holden admits initially and sort of grudgingly in, in steps is first to say that uh, it's not him at, at all, that she's confusing him with someone else. And then then sort of proceeds to reveal that, yes, he was married to this woman, but she's she left him, went back to India 
and and so he never got a chance to divorce her. Uh, but then she sort of pushes him further and further, and sort of gets him to a point where he sort of, you know, reveals what he what he ended up doing. Um, but uh, what did he do to her? Do we think? I mean, it looks like she disappeared and washed up on a beach. So maybe he killed her. Right. I mean, I think there's there's a distinct possibility that uh, that uh, that that could be the case because Jane literally asks him, "Did you kill her?" Yeah, but that's still not the twist. And there's more. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> I I think we shouldn't be so. I mean, no, okay. I mean, it's it it will never be a complete surprise to us when we finally see it. But it will be new to the audience. Uh, I was just um, I just didn't know to what level of detail you wanted me to go into it. But uh, what Jane has done is she's clearly done some investigating of her own and has figured out that. Uh, that Holden and Priyanka had gone to Portugal at some point uh, and that um, he had returned from that trip alone. And so when she confronts him with those facts, uh, that's when Holden finally has to uh, give it up, essentially. Yeah. And, and he wonders now if Jane is now going to leave him now that she knows the truth. Well, and uh, I'm, then I'm going to give up. Uh, the bigger thing is that it turns out that uh, he's the only one in the room, and you have w one of the cleverest transitions I, I've I've seen in, in, in modern history. That you have a way to bind that together. That you don't just see him suddenly alone. It's like you see that this was him all along. It's like this he uh, his 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 guilt created this fantasy figure. Basically, it's very very. It's very, it's very interesting. Can I, can I ask you, Mark? What kinds of things uh, do you see that are like kind of character that could be physically expressed here? Well, the first thing, the first thing I did as I went through the script is to start asking the writer questions to to make sure that I was on the right track. That I wasn't assuming things. And so one of the, and you've answered many of them just in your explanation of the scene this morning. On page one of the script, I wrote at the bottom, describe Holden and Jane's relationship as it will be seen by the audience before this scene starts. So you have said now, it's sort of an on again, off again thing. But, um, that the, and you also put later in the Google document, uh, something I thought was very important, um, that it was important to you that we believe that Holden uh, really cares about Jane. So the opening pages, which are not included in the scene that I sent you, Mark, have them essentially having a, a lover's moment. Um, uh, in terms of her arc, I'm thinking that she doesn't, she might, she might know all of the things she knows, but she's not sure if it's the same guy. Maybe it is, there is there was some mistake. Maybe there was some other person and, and not him. So there's always that little bit of doubt that she's trying to get through. Uh, and I mean, I, I read her as like pretty challenging. Like she's uh, she's putting him on the spot almost on every line. It, is that is that uh, is that how it's thought? Um, she she she's you know he calls her my calamity Jane because I think she is quite uh, strong and aggressive. Mm -hmm. and All right. Okay. So so these this is you know this is the benefit of this kind of discussion and and an inquiry into the depth of what's going on because little adjustments like that can can mean a lot. I'm going to refer to your Google document for a moment. Um, you you have these shot ideas, which I think are very, which are fine, um, and I and I added some stuff here, highlighted in yellow. Uh, you had a wide shot of Jane on the sofa from Holden's POV. Jane has her profile to camera. These are ideas that you have right now. Well, we'll see if that's what happens. And I start to ask the questions like, do you feel Jane is facing towards Holden at this point, or facing away? And when I and 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 my answer to that is she doesn't take her eyes off him the whole time that she's always cool. She's always in eyesight and connected to him because <clears throat> what the audience is going to be feeling is <clears throat> that Jane, and we're going to talk about her emotion and her motivation in a moment is, is fearful of Holden. And, 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 but they at the same time want her to poke at him to tell the truth. But they don't want him, her to poke so hard that he kills her because he, this guy's a little on the edge. 
Um, and, and so that tension, to keep that tension alive in the scene. Can I ask you detail about that? Is, it, is, is she trying to hide that she is looking at him or is that, okay, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm watching you. I'm, I'm make, I mean, how much is he allowed to know that she is looking at him all the time? Like, for example, there are some people who are watch somebody closely, but then when they look, they kind of avert their gaze. But you're just thinking that she's tracking him all the time to make sure. Oh, uh, I, I was actually imagining, I was trying to give them both an activity. He's okay. making dinner. <clears throat> He's chopping things up. It gives him the knife, which is a nice little thing. And we'll talk about yeah. the pros and cons of starting out with that. It's a strong way to start a scene for sure. But at the same point in time, it's a, it's a great thing to keep your eye on as you build towards something as well to sort of increase tension or to have it ebb and flow. And I thought maybe she was just thumbing through a magazine to give her something to do and be able to then look, you know, and have this conversation like it's sort of off the cuff until it's not, you know what I mean? It also would give her some motivation if she got bored with something to move her from the couch, maybe to the table, or perhaps as he's setting the table, if he's going back and forth from the kitchen to the table, there's a, there's a place where, she comes forward and this idea of him moving towards her and being dominant over her being higher than her that i think that's very that's uh, awesome and then and then moving away and then as he moves away perhaps that gives her the strength to move forward and then there's a place where that perhaps they move together and they're at an equal footing and then maybe they sit down those are just the very broadest strokes that i'm that i allowed myself to go through at this point in time that that physical dance but this is super cool this is these are the kinds of shots that speak and then you don't need so many of them i mean then they are then they say something right then then there's real f something going on between them and then you figure out how to shoot it that that part will happen you know mm -hmm. yeah. um I just I don't want to interrupt your train of thought, but I just wanted to say that that idea of thinking about it in terms of the strength a character feels or the threat a character feels, and having that dictate, you know, what they do. I think that's brilliant. I think that's I, brilliant. I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, as an audience person, and I am an audience. That is my whole. One day I'll share with you the humility of. Uh, uh, <laughs> doing something very artsy in front of a big audience and failing miserably and deciding, <laughs> all right, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, <clears throat> I want the audience to know and feel exactly what I'm thinking about or what, or what I want them to feel and think about and not be the least bit uh, uh, obscure. Um, and you have an opportunity here for them to identify with her and uh, and to have that, you know, heart racing moment where they're saying yeah go t poke, poke him for that question get more information you know but but be careful i don't want i don't want him to hurt you you know how are you going to do this well you know she's got to be ready to run at any moment so anyway um can i just clarify something so are we feeling that her rhythm is that she's kind of casually pro probing him in the beginning and then the probing gets more and more pointed perhaps well, there's well, a beat where it becomes more pointed Yes, and I think we'll get to, in a second. We'll talk about defining the emotion and the and the and the motivation. But let's, if her emotion in fact is fear, which I, which she's very clear, and as we go through this, she actually says it in dialogue. I'm I'm afraid of you, and what does she want? She says it. I want the truth. Well, you've done it. You've told the audience exactly what, and I believe her. I don't think she's obfuscating anything. I think she's she. That is what she wants. She wants to get to the truth. And what is she feeling? She's feeling fear. At the same time, she has a certain courageousness about her to, to in fact, have this confrontation. She could have just never called him again. She could have just said, the hell with you. I'm out of here. But right. she did. She wanted to get, she wanted to know what was really going on. And, and, and that's what I think makes it very, very interesting. And I think she's, um, I think she handles people well. She's someone that reads people well. And she consents when she needs to prod and then when she needs to push, hold back a little bit and, and let out what she's trying to let out. And, and wait. I buy that. I mean, that's, I that, that, that pops off know, the page. Until, until he starts to manipulate her again 
and and to lie, which she's very good at recognizing that. And then she goes back and pokes it again to to see if she can get a little more truth out of him. That that dance and that interaction is very interesting human behavior. And I think things that'll be um, the audience will be uh, very helpful. So I think we've actually talked about a lot of that. <clears throat> I'm going to jump just for a moment. I mean, you've made this overall analysis in, in, in the, in the Google document. And I think it's a very clever one, uh, for what happens at the end to not do a traditional master where you see both of them in the shot at the same time. I think that's absolutely correct. And not even to do a traditional over the shoulder to tie his face into her. I think that's correct. I think you can take um, the liberty to tie a piece of him, perhaps his hand, if he was chopping something up or he was doing something with the knife or just a piece of him in the foreground to her to give you an extra level of, again, bringing him closer to her and not, uh, as well as a clean close up. And even if you didn't want to do that with her, to do it with a bit of set dressing or a bit of foreground architecture. Right. You know what I mean? Just to give yeah. you that little sense of, well, there's a little bit of space between us, and now in the closer shot, it, I'm clean. It, it feels more like traditional interaction, and then you, and then when you go back in your mind and line up what really happened in the past, you'll still believe you weren't lied to. You know what I mean? As a as a viewer, so I thought that was an interesting thing to try and do, and and then we'll talk about your transition, which I have to say. I tried to think of about 10 other versions of this, including other movies that I've seen. Uh, the one that comes to mind the most uh, uh, vividly at the moment is Fight Club, which I got to be honest, I, I watched it again for the first time in a couple of years recently. I had totally forgotten about the ending of Fight Club. Fight Club, to me, the, the, the emotional impact of Fight Club, to me, was, a, was, was you know, the, the concept of male rage uh, and, and, and how I'd never seen that personified in a movie that way before. That's what stayed with me. I'd totally forgotten about the ending of Fight Club, where the Brad Pitt character is a total figment of his imagination. Uh, and, and they do their own version of how they reveal this. And in fact, they take you through the literal recreation of what really happened without the other person in the scene. Uh, in in a whole bunch of circumstances, I don't know if you need to really do that or not. If you do the rest of this very well, so let's let's just go back and based on the script, and we're going to assume that people have re read the scene first. Uh, and I, I would I would I would advise anyone who's really interested in this to just t take a moment, stop the tape, read the scene, and then we'll go back. And now, based on the text, define both Holden and Jane's what they want and what they're feeling. And my theory in this is, is that once you define that, those two things stay in place until something happens in, in the scene that, that radically changes them, mm -hmm. that, that you stay with those ideas until something really big has to happen. And when I'm talking about motivations and emotions, I'm talking about the big ones, not little, she was annoyed or, you know. This sort of upset her, but the but the big emotions, fear, love, lust, greed. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we take if we take Jane for example, since she is so forthcoming, as I said, she says in dialogue at the at at the bottom of page two, when Holden says you're investigating my fucking life, and Jane says I'm afraid of you. Well, she just said what her emotion is. She is fearful, mm -hmm. and. And at the top of page three, when Holden says, what are you after? Jane comes out and says, truth. So her motivation, the mantra that this actor should be repeating to themselves after they've memorized their line, <laughs> to reveal the truth, to reveal the truth, to reveal the truth. That's all she should be thinking of. And I say this to you, this is very helpful, especially uh, if you're working with relatively inexperienced actors and you start seeing a lot of acting going on um, to, to help the actor break it down to these two very simple things. So now let's go back to the emotion just for a moment. And, and I would and I do this as a director. I literally go to the location. I go to the set. 
I become the character and I go through these steps. So if fear is the emotion that I've decided that Jane has, I ask myself, where do I physicalize fear? Where do I personally, where does it live in my body? Mm -hmm. For some people, it could live in their jaw. For some people, it lives in their shoulder blades or their neck. For some people, it lives in their gut. I would say for me, when I'm fearful, that's where fear emanates, in my gut. And, and so now I have physicalized my emotion, and my motivational mantra is to find the truth, you know, to convince him to tell me the truth, whatever. The simplest, least amount of word concept of getting to that. And now memorize the dialogue and go and you'll see if you can get uh, especially less experienced actors to do that suddenly magic happens suddenly it's it all becomes very very real the difference between that and a scene that's being acted is like night and day Mm -hmm. then i would do the same thing with holden now holden is much more complicated and and one has to go through the text and uh, although he does, he is, he does clarify in, in some very clear ways. It's not that hard, but it takes a little detective work to do this for every character in every scene. In Holden's case, in my opinion, and, and the Keel, please disagree with me if you think I'm wrong. Um, in Holden's case, uh, I deduce that his motivation, well, I came up with two. First of all, I went to convince Jane that he's truthful, to convince her. That was his motivation. And then as I reread the scene a couple of times, I changed it to not to lose her. That became the more important motivation, to do whatever he had to do not to lose her, that she was his link as we, as we find some kind of sanity. That's quite effective. That, that's pretty effective that, because she's drifting away like all the time in, in every sentence. So he, he has to he's, work he's at it. He's trying to just hold on to her by the, you know, the skin mm-hmm. of his teeth. This, is, this turns out to be the most important thing. We don't realize that in the beginning of the scene, but by the end of the scene, he's quite revelatory about that. And I think his emotion is fear as well. I think he is fearful of losing her. So I would define their motivations and and their motive, and their and their emotions in those ways for these two characters and let that drive the whole scene until we get to page 3 or page 4 and something major happens to change that and my friend something very major happens in your story that changes everything and it's fantastic it's a wonderful turn and and one that if you can pull this off and nobody sniffs at this before you get there is it, the scene is is rich enough to be a very satisfying scene and then to take it to the next level makes it i think so really I, I think that's going to work because what i noticed in 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 all the pages up to that is that the characters they they pop off the page like they have a little bit of bickering and they have all the things that you do when you're real like it's she clearly doesn't just exist for for a plot point right i mean she she comes across as a person and that's why i think that the change at the end will work um but there's something that i would love to do if we could start pinning down a couple of things here um and and talk about the scene in in a little bit less uh, broad strokes like for example you had some ideas for for movement that might be possible angles that might be possible um I I would personally love to understand where the where the major changes are in the scene. So in your in your mind, Nikhil, what is the setting? The setting is sort of an apartment with an open kitchen that leads to a, like a, a a view of a dining room table, and she's on the couch. Is that where you see them starting? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like a simple L-shaped New York uh, City apartment with sort of an open floor space between the kitchen and the dining area with that you know little cutout. Uh, connecting them, like the living area to the side, and then a bedroom uh, as well. Although we, as of now, at least I'm not planning on using the bedroom. So really, it's just sort of this L-shaped area that I'm I'm thinking about uh, staging this in. 
Uh, can I ask then one more question? Because you said, I mean, there, there are kind of two hats we can wear here. One is that we're that we're trying to block a like a lockdown short, where the DP is the actor is also going to be the DP, and therefore we would have to shoot on sticks and that kind of stuff. And then there's the other version where this is not a lockdown short, and you have resources. Oops, and you can get to shoot with your own cameras, and like you can move if you want to. Let's go with the, with the second option. I think yes. that's the rich. Good. Thank you. <laughs> that's what yeah, yeah. you can always fall back. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, well, but, but we I, got Mark. Because I did have a thought about that, um, about if you were going to do, I mean, there's, this is more about what feeling you're going for. Are you going for something that has a little bit of subtle movement all the time? Or are you going for something that's literally on sticks? Like the, uh, the analogy that I would have is Tales from the Loop. Um, because they have somehow managed to create like a, a stillness that just sucks you in, and it's very, very quiet. And it is. and but it it's is. it's incredibly effective. But so the question that I had, for example, is: Are you going for subtle movement? Or are you going for that like lockdown, still feeling? So uh, assuming that we're going with the second way of doing it, right? If you remember the Sherlock uh, clip that I sent you with. Uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and you know the, the really the moving shots that sort of transition from one character to the other um, I'm not sure if you folks got a chance to watch it I like didn't I didn't even see the link I didn't oh I see um, I'm so sorry know, but the, can I I mean but that that sounds almost like pretty action-packed is that com is that a good fit for this scene here no not very action-packed it's literally two people on a phone call he, uh, you know, Sherlock and his brother sort of talking with uh, with each other. But the way they shot it is, you know, they, they move with Sherlock as he's on a call. There's a there's a pillar that comes in the middle, and that pillar sort of wipes into the brother's apartment where he's on the call. And then as he moves, something else wipes, and then we are on Sherlock. So it's a sort of simple way of... <laughs> That's so hard to shoot. <laughs> and, and match cut that sort of give the sense of yeah. uh, tying the two brothers together in this conversation. So as an idea, I thought, well, that would be great to like tie uh, Holden and Jane together. If, even if we did like match cuts on, on them, um, but, um, but I mean, not just, definitely. Can I be completely lot. honest? This rubs me a little bit the wrong way. Um, nope. I mean, it's exactly. a, I mean, I'll Mark, I'll still let you take the lead. I'm just kind of planting ideas here. You're still here, right? Are you just sitting? Oh, there? Oh, yeah. oh, you're sitting very still. It looked like you fell yeah. out. <laughs> I mean, okay. because Mark described some things before where there was a possibility of like juxtaposing people, for example, having him you just having the edge of the knife in the foreground while we're really seeing on her and play on the power I relationship. I think for what you're describing, the kill, I think there's an opportunity for that <clears throat> to be very effective at a certain point in the scene to, yeah, to, to, well. to, to do kind of traditional coverage until we get to a certain point. And then I like the idea of being on him and leaving him and finding her for a key moment. There's a moment where there, that could actually really, what you're thinking at the moment is this is building great tension, you know, what's going to happen. And then as you move away from him and you go on to her, the audience is thinking, well, what the hell is he doing back there? Like, you know, I'm scared now because I can't see him anymore. I think that you could use that with great impact. I don't know if it's a device that I would necessarily use for the entire scene. But, <clears throat> you know, the next step at this point, Per, maybe, maybe to, to get out your shot designer program. And, and <laughs> Should we just plop a couple of things down? Because I'm completely lost on the geography. The, lay out the set and yeah. where the people start. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes after having... Uh, explored maybe two or three versions of of the physical behavior uh, uh, of this. I'll sort of pick the one that I think I like the best, but I've at least explored a couple of others. So especially if the actors come in with another idea, I, I've got a I've got a you know one in four chance of having thought it through and and uh, as well, and then I'm able to sort of not you know be overwhelmed by the dominoes of okay, so what will that mean? five cuts down the road, you know, how will that affect them? 
I had a little note about just in terms of the general style, if it's subtly moving or if it's really standing still, was that if it was going to be completely standing still, there would be the the option of going like all Kurosawa on it, that it's standing still, but there's always like a rain in the background or there's always like, I mean, that's, he just makes, he, cre he creates the most still frames and then there's just this movement on this axis and there's another movement on this axis and they can just sit there and have the most boring conversation for two minutes and it's super interesting to watch and yeah and I there mean, is I, I, that kind of option if you wanted to go the really still route yes um when i so let, let's take a step back let's take a step back um to mark's earlier point about the fact that some of these might apply at certain points in the scene i think that's that's the key point here like not everything's gonna i don't think there's a standard style for the entire sort of scene if if we if that's the question, then I think it is mostly still with very motivated movement yeah. uh, to build tension or to lay in subliminally the idea that maybe these, this is the same person, whether that's in the camera movement or in the match cut edit or whatever that, the case may it's, be. It's cool um, to pick a shot for it. It's just you become a slave to the timing every time you do that. Go ahead, yes. Mark. Yeah, and, and, and this is, again, this is an opportunity to have that idea in mind, as I say, to put a bolo out on it. Be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for an opportunity for that to happen after you have figured out how the humans are dancing in the scene. That's and then yeah. that will give you a... You'll go, oh, there it is. There's the spot. He moved forward or he turned and looked at her. And that threw you right... or And then you threw you right to her looking up at him. It would be the... Oh, God, I've got chills just thinking about it. Should we plop down some quick geography and then, I mean, we could try to put in some things that 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 express the characters. And then, sure. and then maybe we wait on putting cameras in for a while. Like, let's just stick yes. to the characters. Stick to yeah. the people. Yeah. So the shot designer program is very, very adept at moving <laughs> characters around the scene, uh, even animate them. It's, it's quite yeah. lovely. That Soon way. this will also be in 3D. You'll do all the same things, but then you'll also be looking through a lens and then you'll press Animagic. play and, and, then, and then they're walking and talking. You know, can imagine. So, um, uh, is this, you said an L-shaped loft, is this right? So I just put these guys uh, here. Um, I mean, this sounds like this wasn't what you imagined, so just tell me what you imagined, I'll put that in. Uh, no, just trying to figure out what the rectangle in this in the center is. Oh, it's this is this is going to be like a kitchen thing. I mean, or is a dining room table or a. Or I mean, kitchen? are you thinking like a kitchen island? I mean, it's just now. I mean, inevitably we're thinking cameras, but if he's on a kitchen island doing the chopping, it's so much easier to get shots. It's true. Um, yes, essentially there's a countertop there, whether that's an island or or the countertop. I think that that works right there as part of the kitchen. Uh, I was thinking of the table to be on the uh, other side of it. Um, other side? What do you mean? Like, uh, like here, there's the, here, there's countertop space. Like this is kitchen and sink and stuff like that. Is oh, it, I see. Is it, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I was thinking of the countertop as being. They can be countertops all around the kitchen, but I, there's a countertop that that separates the kitchen from the dining area, to to which is on the right. So the dining area yeah. would be like over here. And so are you thinking this would be the island or? Um, let's drop the island. Let's make the, that square that you're on right now. Let's make that the countertop. It's just, uh, and it's open to the, to the rest of the room. And it's yeah. open to the... Uh, so this, th yeah, that's so right. are you it's thinking like this kind of go. kitchen layout where yeah. the kitchen itself is in an L shape. So it's kind of a peninsula island. Okay. Exactly. And then there's going to be an actual uh, dining table somewhere where they're going to sit. Uh, yeah, the square that you have right there would be the table. Then she's going to sit somewhere, I assume. Um, and the uh, the far end of that wall is yeah where there would be a TV and then a sofa in front of it. I think if yeah more or less you have that right. I think the sofa should be yeah more. Is it facing this way or? Well, um, if it's going to be on the counter looking that way. Then you want the sofa on the opposite wall, like here. Yeah, turn that around. Okay. Right. Do you think? How? What do you think about that, Nikki? Uh, that works, yeah, that works. Is that how you saw them? In other words, if he's standing behind that counter looking out, he can see her and yeah. she can see him. And maybe you put the table a little bit more. I mean, I just tentatively drop them here. Go yeah, ahead. So Sorry, you, you were saying, Mark? No, I'm just saying maybe you just push the table a little bit closer to the couch or something so that it becomes a foreground cutting piece. There you go. 
that gives you. Okay, something. yeah, Perfect. I think I, I drew a pretty small apartment, but I guess that's realistic for New York. <laughs> so, like this, I mean, are there going to be tables? I mean, chairs. Yeah, those are the chairs, right? I'll make this yeah. part of the house a little bit bigger because we're running out of space here. <clears throat> Okay, but uh, carry on. So, does that feel about right to you, Nikhil? Uh, yes, it do, does. Do you like do you like to play it? Okay. I think we may want we may want to move the chairs around once we sort of start thinking about. Yeah. It. Sure. I mean, I'm just I'm trying to pick your brain because probably I mean yeah. probably your intuition is consistent with everything that's written. And the, the shape of the <clears throat> table is also very important. The uh, whether it's a square. Okay. Uh, when, especially when they come together, <clears throat> you know, whether it's slightly rectangular, so there's a little more distance between them, just things to consider, or what whether you, it's round and they're closer to, I mean, all of those things are, are worth thinking about. Is it long? I mean, right now, I think this is fine. I mean, when they sit down at the table, what's the relationship like at the time where they sit at the table? Um, they're deep in the middle of the argument, so... And they are sitting opposite each other on the far ends of the table. That's good. And then, and then when you get to your set, you're going to say, okay, well, I just have to make sure I've got enough room to get the camera back, you know, wide enough sure, to sure. get this shot. Or, you know, all those things will sort of come into play. And then you can bust them around. I mean, uh, Nikhil, you you tell me. I mean, it's a. I, I feel like I don't understand the scene deeply enough to be able to judge if if this is right. Uh, Baron, this is this is perfectly uh, workable. Okay, good. Yeah. <clears throat> so Hold, Holden is red and Jane is blue, mm -hmm. and um, and th you know these these feel like they're starting places, and I'm just th thinking of allowing you to have some movement in the scene. Is um, in terms of Holden's activity, he's preparing dinner. Does he occasionally go and set something on the table? Can he work back and forth to this table? Or do you think he stays back there the whole time or until he comes out once? How do you how do you sort of perceive that? Is there a specific time where he definitely comes out? Yeah, what I had in the pages prior to this was um, the idea that he's working and then he hears music start to play, um, a dancey tune. And that's what draws him out. And that's when he sort of sees... Um, Jane dancing by herself. Uh, That's nice. Leans against the wall and watches her for a bit. Um, but that's but this is this is something that would have prefixed the scene. Uh, that that was prior to this particular scene. Yes. Okay. So so he watches her for a moment, and now it's a time cut to this moment. Exactly. Okay. That's great. And that gives it a little. But I mean, I think I mean I think that's an important question that you have, Mark. Because does he move or not? Because otherwise, it's it's very static. I mean, then we have to do everything with everybody basically cemented to the floor. Yeah, Mark. What what do you? I mean, in in a way, that suggestion is interesting because I think you can get a little bit of um, setting up of a table for two is an interesting idea. Uh, especially given where the scene goes. Uh, and I'm thinking that might be uh, an interesting beginning to the... Um, it can I, give it a interesting moment for Holden's beginning. I, I agree. I think he could be cooking dinner and while something... You know, you can see him. Now, you have the scene starting. Jane slouches on the sofa. A surly Holden towers over her still holding the knife he was using to cut the vegetable. So it's a very strong way to start the scene. So he actually does start over here. Mm. He's, I mean, according to the, to, to the current screen direction. Yeah. But, I, but I'm going to propose to you that we explore. Um, I mean, he could. He, and he could still have the... I, I hate to have him just have the naked knife there because I feel it's like it's a little... On the nose, <laughs> Mark, I almost wanted uh, to have like a potato stuck on the on the end of it or something. So it's right. not a thousand percent threatening if you're going to do that. Mark, I think what the, there's a little bit of context. I'm wondering if you're missing, which is that there's a couple more pages prior to this scene that sort of have the other elements that I've, I'm talking about. 
we tried to send you just like the last sort of like a, a, a the finale of the thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So your instinct of like having him set up the table and all that is perfect uh, because I think that speaks to that beginning of the scene when they first interact and, and have a moment of couple down, if you will. Right. Uh, okay. And then she starts to ask, she starts to basically jump into the thing of like saying, well, I would like to marry you, but it turns out you're already married. And then that sort of comes into this. Scene. And then all hell breaks loose. So, so you, that was actually one of my questions too, which, which you've answered was just what it, what happens in the preceding scene. So she sort of appears in the apartment. Obviously they've, they've made, pl maybe they've made plans for a date. Maybe they haven't, but he's pleased by her arrival right when he sees her dancing and that's kind of a sexy thing yeah. um so sure why not let's have him cooking on the stove or there's uh, certainly but do we want to do we want to keep the moment in the beginning where yeah. he's uh, like close to her and taller than her and holding a knife by some means in his hand because so, i mean the, I, the I way that think, i don't think you need it at this point in time i i mean i'm just uh, we'll delete it again afterwards i'm just I'm just uh, putting on here how I thought this was written. I mean, how this this read to me that he's starting over oh, here. The so the conversation starts over here, and then he basically makes his way over here and continues working while they I mean, have the, that conversation. The first line, let's start with the first line of dialogue. She's not my wife anymore. Did we hear Jane make that accusation in the previous scene? That's right. So okay. she says, you have, you know, uh, you're already married, and he says, well, it must be someone else, Holden's a common name, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a little reference to Catch Her in the Rye. And then um, then she says, no, I figured out what your real name is, and I figured out your wife's name, which is Priyanka, and you are still legally married to her. And that's when they have that little conflict moment, and she walks away, and she's sitting on the on the sofa, and then he comes up to her, saying, she's not my wife, not anymore. But even without the preceding scene, you could kind of get all of that just from that line, right? Oh, I think so. But can I ask, I mean, is he supposed to be like a little bit threatening in the beginning? Like, I, I um, told you a thousand times and I don't want to hear it anymore. She's not my wife. So the idea of menace is the reason for the knife that he's holding. Um, whether that plays as menace or not is, I think, uh, what we can work with but you know, do you how, but do you want to i mean was the intention that this is supposed to like it supposed to be possible to read it as menace but it's like it's subtle like like mark said if there's a potato on there then it it's chopping vegetables but it's a knife in the it, room it, it could be him holding a a, 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 a a potato in one hand and, and a knife it's almost like he just thoughtlessly walked out of the kitchen holding the things he was working with i think that's it and then you know she, it can be her clocking that you know just a quick glance to that knife that even he's not he doesn't you don't want to make him feel conscious like he's threatening her there's okay it's here, all about her interpretation of here so comes certainly here comes the first totally camera legitimate way to, oh don't put that camera in there yet <laughs> oh yes damn it i'll delete Get rid it rid of that camera i know you've got you've got time restraints <laughs> now i'm just going to pitch to you another way to play this is to have the revelation from the scene before that he, suddenly she's on to him she he knows now that she knows He's been married before and something happened to this girl. And you could now play them in a time cut where she's on the couch. She's, you know, waiting for dinner. She's like thumbing through a magazine. He's cooking me on the counter and, and he's searching for a way now to find the next beat. He's searching for his, his new backstory, his manipulation. And literally in the middle of cooking, just call out, you know, she's not my wife anymore. And just let this conversation start from a, a slower simmer. Ah, so and, and let me, let it can, can I understand? So it's basically there, like the, the whole first action line there is much longer while he's simmering and then finally he bursts out, she's not my wife. Yeah. So that's right. what and he was like, thinking all along. That's right. And he, and he may not come to her at that point in time. Maybe you play this, this whole beat in the beginning, separate it. I like and, then, and let some time, let, let them go back and forth because she, every response to her she knows more than he thinks she knows. Yes, I like I like the idea that they're separated physically because at this point they have separated <clears throat> emotionally. Mm -hmm. 
Pear, do, do, Pear, do me a favor, mm-hmm. and, and, I, and I'm just going to do this for the sake of this uh, uh, exercise. Pull her couch a little bit closer to the table. Bring it downstage a little bit more. No, you mean uh, down, down down here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Bring everything down. Yeah. a little bit. I felt like I made I made the room a little bit too big. Also, I'm just going to shrink bring, everything bring, a little bit. Maybe move your table table and chairs. Have a little more room behind, just so they can be a little bit closer from. So they're not quite so far away. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's. It felt a little too vacant suddenly. They're a little spread out. And this could also be done depending on your location. You know, if that back wall is right where our where our coffee table is right now, that couch could also be turned ninety degrees, and you could have, you know, the access. Mm-hmm. I can't can't point at the same time, but I mean, you know, there's a version of this where that couch. I mean, I like the opposition; it works for a lot of shots. Uh, so let's just leave it alone for a moment. But yes, the couch could also be turned ninety degrees, and and they could be looking at each other that way. So then let's just pretend that he's he's cooking. And then there's a, we, let's find a place where he, he leaves, you know, what he's doing, the chopping or something's boiling. And now he sets about moving the plates and the, the cups, the wine glasses, the silver. He's setting the table. Um, can I make a suggestion here? Because now, I mean, so it goes from the top of the page. It goes down to at some point he says, y- you investigating my fucking life. That seems like a great time to arrive near her and be towering like he sure used does. to be in the in the beginning. So at the at the bottom of page two, it says, I mean, they talk and talk and talk. And then he says, you investigating my fucking life. That would bring that would bring him to her. Yes. And basically with the same kind of feeling that we used to have in the beginning of the scene. Yeah. And even not completely to her. It could just bring him to the table. Yeah. I mean, you know? he, he's going to be taller than her either way. Yeah. Yeah, even that far is good. And she can she can stay on the couch. She can hold her ground. Yes. Uh, as she starts to reveal these things and she and and her and she's being honest. I'm afraid of you. Yeah. Can I ask the um is the how how much is it intended here that they face each other? So we talked about that she is kind of keeping at least half an eye on him all the time. Is he facing her? Like, for example, if he goes up to the to the table here, um, does he look at her and say, "You investigating my fucking life," or is he saying that with a little bit of the his side to her? I mean, I, I would want to see the actors block it and play, you know. But I think my 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 instinct says that they might want to face each other. But I could totally see an actor sort of playing it differently, and I would. Yeah. Um. I mean, you could, he could you could you could say that line pair and throw it away. What? Yeah. Are you, <laughs> sure. Are you investigating my fucking life? Like it's a joke. Well, it just seems like it's a, it's it seems like it's a it's a beat. At least that's how I read it because that's where he's suddenly understanding her probing. It it's definitely important and you know there's a play though where he could just be trying to diffuse all of of her insistence initially. Mhm. And then and but she she is very strong about this, you know. I'm, uh, in terms of every one of her responses, as you see, she she's much more direct. He's obfuscating, I think, a bit more. But if I'm, you, uh, uh, Perry, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. But if you look at the next exchange that he has, he says, "Not this paranoid shit again." You know, take your goddamn meds. So I think there's a little bit of like he's being manipulative more than yes. He's, angry powerful you know he's trying to be like you know what you are not on solid ground here so like t- take it easy because you know it, there's a little bit of that going on a little bit of um, yeah. I, I uh, made that same note that here here we established earlier that jane is on emotionally shaky ground and so yeah. that we think oh she, it's, it's just a crazy girlfriend you know who's got these wacky That's notions yeah. um yeah, I, think, I mean, or he's he's dismissing a, a completely uh, completely reasonable inquiry, like he's dismissing right. it as stupid. Um, but I mean, it's on this note about I mean, on this issue about whether he's facing her or not. I mean, I'm all for obviously letting the actors feel it out, but I mean, I I think sometimes actors just that's the default position is everybody facing each other, and. And so I think, at least that's my personal opinion, that it's uh, that it's fine to show up on set with a preference, and then uh, if it really, if they feel something else, then we switch to that. I have a question for Mark here. 
Uh, Mark, there's this idea of like, you know, crossing the line, right? Where you really sort of show them on opposite ends of, of, of to establish the line. But in this particular case, because we sort of reached this revelation of that they're the same person, I thought there's an interesting potential here for, you know, crossing the line where we have them both facing the same direction. Uh, and I'm just wondering in this particular scene, if we had Holden on the other side of the table, like on along the wall, just okay. like she is, that might be an interesting thing where he's looking at her sideways and then he's facing forward when he wants to avoid her and he can look at her when he wants to challenge her. Just a thought that just popped into my head as we're looking at this. Well, you could do that without even crossing the line. I'm sort of of the school uh, of simplicity until I really, you know, don't, can't get there. And, and, you know, once you do, once you, now you're, you're, you have an interesting circumstance here, which is that you aren't doing traditional overs. So you aren't doing that. The, you're not doing that tie-in, but I do also think that the, that after two cuts of, of crossing the line of two people looking the same way, this is just in my experience. Um, and we do this on our show, by the way, all the time, we've thrown the line out the window. Uh, I find after a couple of cuts that I become cognizant that something's wrong. Uh, Mark, let me just jump in there. Um, I would not cross the line here. I just meant at the very end for oh, just yes. final shot, maybe cross the line. I, that's a great idea. To, but, to uh, like, but can I ask, yeah, for do you mean, are you talking about cutting across the line or just moving across the line and shifting the coverage over on the other side? Well, in this case, we're not going to be crossing the line at all. We just want to move him. If yeah. we move him uh, along the wall on the other side of the table, I'm just saying it might be an interesting way to then get the coverage, you know, between them, where he's actually looking to her at the side as opposed to but like that, standing. That's a super fun idea. That his default position, his most useful place to stand, is not one where he's facing her. So he faces her on purpose when he does it. Right. I mean, we don't want to put cameras in right now, but let's just pretend you put one right behind Holden right now where he's looking profile as he's setting the table. And, and of course now we don't want to t necessarily tie him into this. Um, but that would be his coverage. And then, and we know because we're going to see something in the foreground, uh, that she is, she's looking at, I think that would work. I think you, that, I think that's a perfectly good way to do that. Would you be okay if we just threw in some tentative cameras? Okay. I mean, put some cameras in. Okay. So just describe the shot that you had. No, it's just because I'm, I'm, I'm starting to struggle to imagine all the possibilities. Well, now here's, here's the deal. Do you, do you commit to the idea of not doing traditional over the shoulders in this? Absolutely. Completely. Okay. Then, then I would, I would then pull him a little bit further away. So we don't, we don't feel like we're missing it. Like, have him land a little bit at the opposite end of that table. Um, can I ask something for just yeah. to clarify? Um, I mean, I'm on. I, I get the the thing about not doing traditional over the shoulders, where you kind of have to face each other anyway. But are we then talking more about a kind of coverage where we try to get people a little bit into the foreground of each other's shots? No, we're saying not to do that. So, but does does that make everything a single? Well, that's why I was trying to introduce this idea of not tying in the traditional over the shoulder where you see his face. But if he was setting the table, you could come over his hands. Exactly. And, and things in the table to see her in the background as a piece of coverage and then go tighter. So yeah. that, but that was what I meant, that we try to get like edges of people into the yes. foreground of each other's shots. Edges of things. Yeah. Edges of things. And yeah. Maybe his hands. At cool. The most. I I like that a lot. So, um, so I mean, I'm just gonna put in a, a shot yeah, here. That right, that's right for that. There. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's the shot. It. It's there and it's tighter. Yeah, it's something like this. Well, it's along lines. So yeah, it's wherever he and wherever he moves, he could move down the table, and you could move. You know, you could adjust for that, and then it's a tighter version of her. That's a lot of her coverage right there. It is. Um, would you have a similar shot over when he's working over here? Down low, yeah. I mean, just something like just getting a hand in the foreground. For yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, and and tighter, you know, for sure. Yeah. What do you What do you feel, Nikhil? Uh, that looks That looks great to me, folks. Um, 
I'm just going to check out the cover, the, the pictures that you brought as examples. Um, are we only talking about Jane's coverage here? Just want to make sure. But well, see, sort of if if you look at if you look at the third uh, picture that uh, that you brought in this, oops, that's the wrong thing. I just clicked on there. Um, see this kind of picture here, the third one. That to me looks exactly like the kind of coverage you would you would yeah you would pepper this with. And this was this was why I was probing it so much about whether we see him from the side. Because then he is a little bit unavailable, both to us and to her. You could do this in two sizes, and you know, and then he, you know, he's looking down at what he's doing when he wants to sort of not deal with her directly, and then he's looking right when he looks off camera to her. I think that works beautifully. And you actually on at the bottom of page two, you have a similar shot, but that's but that's uh, with her because then. This was what you said, that she's facing him on purpose, but otherwise she's angled in a way where she's she's not completely forthcoming. I mean, basically, facing a little bit away from each other, that's that's the archetypal way to show disconnect in a relationship. Yeah, so. I think there, just to have a little bit of journey to the scene, a little bit of arc to the scene, I think there's a moment later on where I think they could come more face-to-face, -face, you know, and I think I'm just trying to give it mm -hmm. a sense... Uh, sense of that growth, I guess, and that energy. Well, let's let's find that. So let's imagine yeah. that for the first part of the scene, he's working back and forth. She stays on the couch, and he comes close to her. There's moments where that'll be very powerful, like, um, you know, you're investigating my fucking life. They have that play where he's closer at the table, and she looks up, I'm afraid at you, and, sh and he's above her. What are you after? The truth. Uh, and then the not this paranoid shit could be the way he dismisses her and manipulates her as he retreats back. Yeah, he kitchen. walks back exactly. You know, I mean, so I, that's okay. the kind I'm of just gonna like I'm just gonna first. take some notes because it's a pretty long scene here. So basically, that's where he would walk back. Now, these are the kind of things that, as you say, Nikhil, you work out with your actors what feels right to them as a line to move on or not move on. And then, you know, and then she looks up and says, did you kill her in Portugal? That's, that is new information to Holden's, right? You have it there off his surprise. Like, she knew that? And now he has to where, find a way Where is that line? Sorry, it. That's the fourth line on page three. Oh. Uh, okay, but that's also, I mean, that's, I mean, that's still him retreating. So that's him going into hiding. It is, and it's also, you did something very clever here in the screen direction after he, he tells her to take her goddamn meds. She doesn't take, well, she does sort of self-medicate. She pulls out a cigarette, uh, which is a <laughs> form of medication, and, we, and you established taking a draw and, and exhaling the smoke. That's a fabulous idea to subconsciously tee that idea up right there in the scene. This is this is all beautiful. I just uh, I'm just uh, I'm just spitballing here, okay? I mean because so it says um, Holden still knife in hands, uh, basically. So he he walks back and then uh, says this shit will kill you. And then she confronts him. Did you kill her in Portugal? And now he's kind of back at the kitchen there, and he has a, like a long thing. Of course you do. Portugal it was about saving our marriage. If he at some point during that sentence like put the knife into the chopping board. Um, because that would betray a completely different, uh, th I mean that, because the, this, what he says all sounds very nice and he's explaining, no, oh, this cool vacation we had, but if he like stabs the knife into the chopping board, that betrays some, uh, some aggression underneath. Is that useful? Could that be useful? Um, uh, that's, that, that's a great thought there. I don't think he needs to actually go back into the kitchen at this point, because I think that's, that would be repeating the beat that we already did earlier. Uh, I think what would be great here is, of course you do, maybe well, slam some mm -hmm. on the table where he's sitting, and, and, and then he sort of, essentially he's at this point, he's taking a different tack, and he's taking a more... Um, Okay, then, then I'm a little confused because we talked about up at the top here, um, I mean, truth. What did you do to your wife? And he says, not this paranoid shit again on a Friday night. Take your goddamn meds, Jane. This is where right. we talked about that he retreats and walks back. But you feel it's better that he stays? So, uh, no, I, I think he retreats and walks back into the kitchen. And then 
there's a time gap, I think, is maybe what's not clear in this script here. So there, there's a new beat that starts here. So we could now be on Jane lighting a cigarette. And it's almost like a new moment. But it's still, if he walks back, then he would have to walk back to the table one more time. And yes. Very it, quickly. It, Either he walks back to the table if you want to make it continuously, or we take a time cut, like a a, a jump cut. Why is it? I don't, you, think, why? I don't think I take a time cut. I, 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 there's so much tension going. On. I mean, I think her response I, to lighting the cigarette is is you know is is a is quite, works quite continuously. Uh, yeah, you'd cut that moment. You'd you'd put a break. Your on goddamn that meds, Jane. Yeah, you know, and and now she's a little bit nervous. There's something to be said for him. As he retreats, for him, that she's braver when he's further away. So if he dismisses her as a crazy person, you know, as he's walking away from her, and she, and now he's a little bit safer distance, she can then say to him, "I know you were in Portugal," and and that's a, that's a little bit. Otherwise, you, you know, I, I just think you have a little more time left before you have to bring them together. Because at some point in time, you want them to both come to the table, sit down in the chair, be in opposition with each other at the, right at the table for that for the final conflict to happen. I think you've got time for one more volley, you know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on Mark's side on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, because yeah. you will have that, because the, my next question otherwise would be, is that good that he ends up back to the table because the, the, the conversation feels normal and he's sitting in a normal place? Did we just suck the energy out of it? That was kind yeah. of my question. Mark's question, Mark's point around losing the tension with any kind of a time cut and also the idea of like she feels safer with distance. I think both of those resonate. Because with she really does confront him there. I mean, this is where she asks what she has been wanting to ask for a while. It, it's a, that's a big moment for her. And, and so she needed a she needed a cigarette. It's like she I, needed I, medicine. I drink before I actually could, yeah. you know, say the words I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so I, so I, are I, are we okay that he he walks back and then the and then let, he's let, her, let him go back and fuss around in the kitchen a little bit more he's got a few more things and he can then while he's saying of course you do Portugal he's going to cut now he's manufacturing all these excuses uh uh it was just about saving our marriage she only agreed to go with me because I got these tickets to this concert by a musician she admired Portugal's cultural treasure I mean that's all bullshit that can be played at that, and she can be clocking him, cl clocking what he's doing, watching his reaction. Well, that's half of it. The other half is that there is a, there is an opportunity for for expressing. Like, for example, if he's annoyed, he could just start chopping the vegetables a little more. Yes. Jing, jing. Um, while he's being this very, oh, this is no big deal. Jing, jing. Yes, <clears throat> there's, there's, there, there's good things. There's good possibilities and so i mean that's that's kind of uh that's my feeling about props is that they ought to reveal the thing that's exactly not being said so that you kind of it leaks out through your prop use i think that's something definitely to explore yeah. in the rehearsal you know what and to give him to give him some activities that he can play with that then he feels comfortable with not so that it becomes so burdensome that you know in the timing and the stuff, but something that he can really do that feels natural and that your poor prop man can be there to, you know, to resupply the, uh, the fresh uncut, whatever it is <laughs> right. over and over. But, but the point is that this line here, I mean, th th this begins to answer why he says all that stuff and explains all that with Portugal. He's not just, it's not just a public service announcement. Like what if he is a little annoyed? I mean, this line of questioning is starting to get annoyingly close here. You don't understand Jane. This is what really happened. And that too. And, uh, my sure. question for Nikhil was um, when he's describing their experience together at the concert, uh, she had a great time at the concert, smiling, laughing, clapping, but she never looked at me, not once. He's, he's implying that she ignored him the whole time. Yeah. You know, the amazing thing that has just happened here, Mark, uh, and, and they're in conversation with you guys, is that as a writer, I wrote this with the uh, imagining Holden to be sort of lost in that moment of, it's like almost like a sense memory moment, you know, mm -hmm. of that time. And I'm recognizing now, as we go through this discussion, that he's bullshitting on many levels, and this could be all throwaway. I you love, know, that was I love layers. Is this, is this true? Did this even really happen? 
or did something like this happen? Enough of it happened that he could conflate this excuse. Yes, I think it's conflated. He maybe you read an article about a musician. Like he's just, it's like, you know, the yeah. usual suspect type of shit. Um, <laughs> that's how this, um, but yeah, so I think I love it. I think I really, really love it. I see it now with, the, with new eyes. And I think this could be, this is really about him bullshitting because then things escalate on the next page when she goes because she's not buying any of it because she's no. i mean she she's just taking down the his his bad logic yeah and how do you when she now this starts to get very interesting to me with jane i kept imagining how, her delivery because her words are very direct but there's always you know there's always the what and the how how she delivers it is is sort of everything. It, she's trying to not let this get so out of control that he overreacts and kills her or tries to kill her. And at the same point, she wants to get to the truth. So do you see her as being measured when she says something like, you said, you know, she catches him in the lie, you said you dropped her off. I'm getting a whole new vibe to her, honestly. Um, and this is not a vibe I had before this conversation. I'm getting the vibe. I mean, you know, we started talking about the opening dance that she does, and it's a little bit seductive. And I think it has to be something where she, as a woman, uses what she knows works with Holden like that. to placate him, to to get him to say the truth as if, She's his trusted confidant to seduce him, perhaps. I mean, maybe that's too much, but I almost see him, see her sort of like touching his buttons on it, maybe buttoning up his shirt while she's saying, you said you dropped her off or, you know, like maybe it's that close. I don't know. I never really thought about doing that. But now that idea is sort of taking hold in my mind. Well, well this, this you know, is, that, yeah, go ahead. that's interesting to explore. I, I never imagined her getting that close to him that quickly. Yeah, but just in terms of her tone and the notion of using whatever manipulative uh, or psychological uh, uh, tools she may have to get him to tell the truth, that's what she wants. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. It, it's so cool to write text with one subtext in mind and then swap out the subtext and then it's like oh my god where did all that depth uh, suddenly come from but uh, yeah. but it's uh, good we're making excellent progress here I mean we haven't put in any cameras but we understand the characters well, that's okay. where do you think in the scene he's done setting the table and where do you think she now moves to the table because at some point in time she's going to come and sit down He's going to sit down, and they're going to be like, where do you think that happens? Uh, my instinctual answer is when he says, of course you do, I think that's maybe the point. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe Where Where are you? Where are you on that? Hold He's on, on page three, halfway yeah. down. Let me, course, let me actually dismiss that idea. Um but she never looked at me, not once. I think somewhere in that monologue, I think she has to show that he's reaching her. And maybe that's when she comes to the table and sits across. That's pretty good. It sounds like a reasonable explanation. It sounds like he was emotionally hurt. He's using that as a way to find some kind of emotional cue that she could be okay with. Maybe, maybe at that point in time, she starts to come closer before he says, uh, and, and they start to sit down while he's saying, we got back to the hotel, right. she took her bags, got in the cab, left for the airport, and they're, now they're seated together. It's the last time I saw can I, her. Can I ask, so does, does this, this sounds like this long thing here that Holden says that he basically starts to earn her trust during that. Exactly, and she and, like and, and they exactly. get closer to each other, and then he says, and then he says that thing where she at last he took her bags, got in a cab, left for the airport. Last time I saw her, and at that moment she's available to him, but then it doesn't compute. He says, "But you, you, know, if, if, you if, said you if, dropped if her off." If they're both seated by the time he's saying, or if they're sitting by the time he's saying, you know, where where you have beat, 
where he says, you never looked at me, not once. And now he's sort of, you know, he, the table is set and she starts to move towards him. He continues his explanation about the hotel, the bags, the cab. The last time I saw her, they're both seated at that point in time. And you think, well, maybe he's convinced her that this is the truth. And she comes back with, you said you dropped her off. Like he catch, she catches him in a lie. And now they're closer together. That's good tension building. But where do you see her coming from when, uh, when you said, when she says, but you said you dropped her off? Like, has she, Has she has that question been burning underneath and she's still like the district attorney or has she warmed up to him? But then the last thing he says doesn't make sense. If she mo if she moves closer during his explanation and normally I wouldn't move someone while somebody else is talking. But I think you can get away with it in this circumstance. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking I'm just looking for the place, you mm -hmm. know. That, that at some point in time, it's about having dinner and, and we're going to have dinner together and we're going to have this conversation and she's going to she's going to come and get them in opposition to each other now seated on a on a on the same level. By the time he gets to the last that was the last time I saw her and she comes back and she and you think that she's been maybe impressed by that or that's a satisfying explanation. But her response is, you said you dropped her off. He's, she's not done yet. And now he has, now they're seated. I did. I got confused. I don't remember details. Look, I'm sorry. I, I, I should have told you everything. You should have told me the truth. Everything I told you is true, which of course is a lie. But so, and, so does she warm up to him during this sentence here? Like this, his long explanation, does she genuinely warm up to him or is she still suspicious all the way through it? I think, uh, per, the, I think what you're hinting at Uh, is the fact that she, her suspicions get aroused on that last bit. He overplays his hand yep. on yeah. the last bit. Because then, he, because then you have this budding intimacy that then... But he overplays his hand. And then it's, the intimacy starts to shut down again. And those, that's kind of a nice little movement, I think. You know, this is the kind of thing that... Um, you can absolutely do with the actors and probably save yourself a lot of time. But yeah. this is exactly the kind of scene where I would go to that location and be both of these people and walk through and, the scene. And, and hopefully there's nobody around to hear me say the dialogue out loud, feel my feelings, focus on my motivation and let myself move and see if I can find another place. I mean, you could delay it a little bit, You could delay it, her move to the table until after you should have told me the truth. Everything I told you is true. He could sit on that line and she could be moving towards him now from the couch to the table on her line at the top of four. Her body was washed ashore on the that's beach awesome. three days after. I mean, that's, that could also be the place where now she moved. He could sit first. She could move to him. Now they're both seated at the end of, but. The old you no longer exists. You became holden. I mean, you could wait that long as well. So yeah. those are the things to play with. You know, that's should, the, should we make a tentative choice here? Um, if it, uh, because there are so many options in the air. Like, should we just pick yeah, one? So let's pick the choice that Mark just talked about because okay. I like the idea of movement on that long bit that she does. I'm a little unclear that, when this happens. So, and, so and, she, and actually, she would what happened? Move on. She would move after Holden. Holden sits on everything I told you is true. Um, but and then she when, moves on, and then she moves on. Her body washed ashore in Triara. But Triara. before that, he has been over here, and he walks back to the table and does. Yeah, he's been work. He's been working back and forth, and now the table is set. And on, she says, "On what line?" I did get, she, he, like, say he walks back to the last time on, I did, I got confused, don't remember details, look, I'm sorry, I should have told you everything, he could sit on that line. Yeah, okay. You, you know what I mean? And she could say, I, you should have told me the truth, well, everything I told you is true, and he motions her, you know, to sit down, and now she comes and makes her cross to sit on. So when does she move? When do you feel she that moves she moves? on her body washed ashore. So over on the next page. Yeah. This is the delaying it version. Oh, so she's like almost doing like a courtroom uh, victory yeah. lap there. Exactly. She's That's very like. nascent. 
Oh, cool. So she she stays all the way back here. So that means that we don't actually even know if his spiel is working. That's correct. Now, you might find, McNeil, that maybe there's some activity, you know, if you like the idea of her thumbing through a magazine uh, before, because she's smoking her cigarette. You know, she could also find a place where she gets up and she goes to, she has to go find an ashtray, you know, to put that one out, you know. And then she lights up another one once she gets to the table. Like, you, there's a place that she could also dance around a little bit uh, if you don't want to have her planted for the whole scene. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Could but be. but she, I mean, so she would be over in this area, I guess. Yeah, she's going to remain in her, either at the coffee table, or if there's a little hutch there, or, you know, the stereo system, whatever the record, whatever the device was, you know. Or just put uh, out the cigarette and light a new one. Just, you know, as I always, as I secretly do is one of the, the, the things that I glean from this activity is to go ahead and plant the props where I want the actors to go in advance. I shouldn't really be saying that in a, a, on a broadcast uh -oh. like this, but, but I do. I the jig is up, man. In a way to sort of give the actors a natural way to move. And to put them in in a place where I think later I'll okay. be able to actually. Shoot. But I'm just going to make her go over here and get something and come back, and then and you then can she comes back, and then, then you can sprinkle that in. Yeah. Then she makes her move at the top of four. He's already seated now. Okay, so that means that uh, he will end up here. He's going to end up there facing her, and then we'll see if the camera dollies around and stays on the same side of the line, which you might want to do. Uh. Um, at this point then, or you may let him maybe everything i mean the easy the easy thing to do would be um to i mean sorry that we're now talking shop and not character yes. but the it seems like the easiest thing to do would be to gravitate all the coverage inside of this triangle here and that means that there's kind of a natural moment when he moves over here now we yep. start to be on the left side of him and she, she comes and sits down, and and you've got the corresponding on the other deal. So put her in her chair now. Um, standing up. Does she does she go straight to the chair, or do you feel like she has a moment? Somewhere before? in there, she's gonna she's gonna stand, and then she's gonna sit. Okay, so something like this. Yeah, yeah. So something like that. something like that. So. I mean, this is also, in. if this space is even a little bit confined, you're going to have to have that line cross. So now, Nikhil, you got your line cross, and it, it wanted Look to happen. That. It happened all by itself. It happened all by itself. <laughs> but this is nice, I mean, because this is also, I mean, the, the mood is very different here towards the end, and you feel a different move when you mood, when you find your when you find yourself on the other side of the line. And then I'm going to race ahead here, because I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. I mean, now she definitely, you know, cues in and she takes a deep drag on the cigarette. I love this. Um, are you going to leave me again? Are you going to lie to me again? And then he says, truth is death, which, of course, this is the moment that Holden's motivation and a moment's change. This is his moment of change now, right? He has to let go of this fantasy this fictitious thing that's going on in his head and he caves there's a version of this and i and I'm, I'm not suggesting that you don't shoot him saying the line you absolutely should do that but there is a version of this scene if you have actors with enough connection and expressiveness where he doesn't even have to say that yeah are you gonna lie to me again and, you know, there's a moment where you could be pushing into his reaction and see his world come crashing down upon him. And then he starts to tell the truth. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I'm just going to draw what you said here because that's nice. Uh, and then he and then he and then he does. And I'm assuming now that this speech on our last day in Portugal, that that is the truth. That is the truth. That's really what happened. He he didn't really mean to push her off the boat. He just pushed back at her and sh in anger, and she fell and died. Yeah, but he did not tell anybody. He did not try to right. rescue He didn't tell. That's right. He didn't tell anybody. Yes. Um, this is so true. In, you know, these half-truths happen so often in life. 
Mm-hmm. And it's and it's one of the wonderful things about this scene that I think people will immediately recognize. It's, this happens all the time. So, Mark, I'm going to have ask you a question on this on that particular monologue, and this might this might be a bit of an art house take on this monologue. So that's why I want to run it by you. I want to see what you think about it. I had this thought that if I recorded both Jane and Holden doing this monologue, and then in the edit, sort of cut between both of them doing the monologue, as if he's speaking and she sort of almost knows what he's going to say. What do you think of that idea? Is wow. It I, you know, the, the, the last thing you said made me believe it could work. I wouldn't do it at the start. Hmm. Let him Let him admit it. We didn't say a word to each other. On the ferry ride back, she stood alone, staring out at the sunset. I felt her for, I felt her contempt for me. And then maybe she could add her complete rejection of you. I think you got to change the words a little bit. Okay. Her complete, and then he says her complete rejection of me. I mean, you say it twice. I felt her contempt for me, her complete rejection of me. That works. I tried to hold her hand. She pushed me away. I pushed back. Maybe she says she went over the railing and hit. What was in? What would be interesting is if she says the the factual, physical things that happen, the things that he refuses to admit to himself. Yeah. 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 So she says the parts that are true. She yeah. says the really true physical. She paints the picture, not the feelings yeah. of That's what it. really happened. And then even even in that last moment, her eyes glared back at me. This is his interaction. I glared right back. We both died in that moment. Maybe it's just a couple of times. So you're not gilding the lily. You know what I mean? You yeah. just you give yourself a little bit of space at the end. Where I mean, it also in. it would be nice because it gives you some movement and some natural beats in in what is all otherwise a, a concrete wall and of text. It feels totally uh, uh, copacetic <clears throat> with the rest of the scene. This is what's been happening. This sort of volley back and forth has been happening all along. So it doesn't feel like it's some weird introduction. I think that's a very interesting idea. For example, cool. you have I felt her contempt for me. And then she says her complete, her complete rejection of you, or something like that. That her yeah. complete rejection. Yeah. You know, you could at, least not, at least you're not dismissing the idea right away. That's that's good to hear. Oh no, I think this I, now because it feels like she has gotten him to a point where he's now doing what she has wanted. She is fulfilling her motivation. He is telling her the truth for the first time, and she's going to help him do this. She's not running away in terror. She's not accusing him of being a horrible murderer. She's hearing him out and allowing him to reveal the truth that up until this point he has not been able to do. And then you still have the line, I glared right back. We both died at that moment. And wild, wild Holden was born and calamity Jane. It's almost. This is the, con- this is the continuation of that rhythm. Yeah. This, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's almost, there's irony in what she's saying. There's almost humor in it, dare I say. I mean, there's a, there's a, but it is the, it is the realization of what has happened. And it's not a bad thing for the audience to hear those words because it's, it, it, because it doesn't reveal anything specifically mm-hmm. until the next cut. And I think that's a fabulous moment where she inhales on the cigarette. I wrote on your little script page um, in your Google Doc, the smoke curls up in the air. Great to set up the smoker. Maybe there's a foreground. I did all that. Well, that she, yeah, she takes, you know, she inhales on the cigarette. You have it. And that, and then you, and then how, what were you thinking? Do you think this is a, is it a cut of her inhaling on the cigarette? And then just a, a re, the, the reverse that we've seen through the whole thing where he's sitting there with the with the, what would be the cigarette in etc a tighter size with the cigarette off camera and he exhales and then reveals that he's smoking like how do you see that moment revealing itself so uh, that was the point where i was talking about crossing the line so let's let's imagine the two of them are sitting facing each other you cover okay. this side of him so you see jane she's looking uh, left to right you see holden he's looking right to left and that's the exchange that's happening in singles, right? 
And then for the last drag, you see Jane, she inhales. And then you cross the line and you get Holden from this side. So he, oh. looks, he looks like this and he exhales. So it's sort of like a match cut. Yes, no, it's a match cut. That's, that's good. That's so, good. That was that's, sort of the that's the that's the way to use two people looking in the same direction in a in an unconscious way, what appears to be an unconscious way, and then turns out to be very important. And, right. And uh, at then the you point. cut out your white, and then it's just him at the. And end. then it's just him, and you and you think that you drop back to that, right? It's not like a pullback to reveal, because your point that you made somewhere was very very smart, which is you don't want. It, anybody to think for a second that she got up and left. You know? Yeah, I think that's the danger. Yeah. With it. So I want to make sure that there's no way that could possibly. So if it's, if it's a cut back to a wide shot that we haven't even seen before, um, you're going to, you're going to know that, you know, she's not in the room. She, and she was never in the room. Right. Wow. Amazing. Um, so, so um, how about we just take 10 minutes, just pile in some cameras. Now, now you can do all that wacky camera stuff. Yeah. No, you too. <laughs> Come on. No, no, no. You're very good at this. I want to watch you. Me? Well, I'm just, I mean, I'm completely lost every time I start a scene. I'm I like, mean, oh my I God, mean, now we have to we do have this. opportunities for very, some very lovely stylized moments. You know, obviously, while he's working in the kitchen, you could do some straight on coverage of him, just his face, and definitely some, you know, inserts of his hands working and you could definitely find some moments where he's cutting or stirring or doing something that tilt up to him you know you could do a pass like that what i call you know a sort of swingle pass where i'm where i i might do a, a take where i just let the camera operator you know start at his face and then find a place where you know you cut away to something that he's doing or pan down to it tilt back up to his face at a moment mm -hmm. and have that as a take that you can intercut if you yeah. want to or not you know. Yeah, so just like an uh, up and down take and some inserts. Um, yeah. And so there's another cut of the same setup. So it's not costing you another lighting setup. It's just letting your camera operator read the scene and feel some moments. We do this a lot on our show in interrogation room where we're, we're plopping down evidence in front of the person, you know, um, a photograph of the crime scene or some piece of evidence. I'll do a, I'll do a, I'll do a profile, uh, shot where i start in profile on the on one person's face i'll go down to the evidence that's being slid across the table come up to the to the perpetrator you know and and just do a whole scene like that or just yeah swing it back and forth you know but those and are nice. nice you you end up using nice. that i mean yeah, you'll end up using it it yeah. gives you a little bit of style without having to invest too much time but i mean yeah. but the example I'll that you had here was actually that you're using this for connecting i mean you so I mean, the the end result is that you're going to use that for getting from one character through the evidence over to another character. Are there similar options here? Yeah, it's it's good for that. You could be on him and cut down to something, and that gives you a natural cutting uh, place to her without always having to go from one person to the other directly. Mm -hmm. Just gives you a little bit of. Freedom so I there. feel like I mean, uh, Nikhil, I feel like the pictures that you pulled out here are. I, they're kind of strong. Like if you have these kinds of pictures and, and, uh, and you know, it's like uh, rim lit and stuff like that. So you're getting, I mean, I would almost say that people are from the side a lot in the beginning and then we get to their fronts uh, later. I think these are very, very strong. And I would just say, you know, because they're, and they're pretty tight. Um, give yourself one size larger as we said, with some little foreground cutting piece to make it feel like it's over something, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a, a hat, a coat rack or something, or, you know, uh, hanging pots from an overhead, you know, uh, pot rack or something just to give you a little bit of foreground, something, okay. something that's on the table or on, on the kitchen table on her reverse to him that gives you a little bit of slightly wider thing. And then do your, your, your coverage and you might even decide at some point in time to go one size tighter you know to to really get in to a super extreme pass um which you know personally i would save for the moments that really call for it i'm going to do something that's a little weird here but it's just that if she's going to drop ashes once in a while it would be nice that he's in the background and then the ashes kind of come she drops yeah, it down the only thing is that it's a little weird with the line because the line is really here it um, won't matter Huh? Won't matter. 
It won't matter well, because we're not seeing her. I mean, it, that's right. Yeah. You can, you know, the whole crossing the line thing, I have this conversation with our script supervisor on a regular basis. And, and I, and I say this to you as I, I, I came from a very traditional editorial background. I was an apprentice film editor. I was an assistant film editor. I was a film editor. I, I worked through the Hollywood system. Um, and, and and with some wonderful editors and you learn very quickly you can kind of get away with murder most of the time most of the time yeah there'll be a point where you you'll get caught but all the which and once you know all those rules you know cutting on motion and cutting when people are walking and you know talk, talk, talk saying dialogue while people are walking once you sort of know them then you sort of can figure out well yeah, but in this circumstance, it doesn't matter. You know, I can get away with this. I think uh, I think where line jumping breaks is when you're cutting across close shots, cutting across the line on close shots, and doing it multiple times, and doing you it can, multiple you can, times because you can get away with about three cuts. You can go like from one person to the other, and then maybe even back to the other person, and then that's about it. One more. Yeah, time but then you relax and find your place. You're, um, that's right. But it's when you when you cut across the line for the close shots. What you actually do is a rewrite because you make it look like other people are talking to other people, and oh, yeah. and and that's uh, that's weird. So I mean, but this is uh, this is not enough. I mean, um, like you couldn't just take this and go shoot it. Still, I guess you no, could. Is, well, you could, and now and and now there's opportunities depending on what the actual activity is to find some closer coverage that has a little bit of movement to it. So you kind of have that. You've got a couple of cameras on Holden, which is great. Um, yeah, I'm just going to put a, close. I mean, I, okay, let's decorate it a little bit. I am going to put a slider over here that just sits here and just. Yeah, it goes back and forth. Back and forth. Um, you could do, uh, on her, on his coverage, you have now him technically over the, the, say, the coffee table back to him. You could do a size that's, like, if you move the dining room table over a little bit, you could do a size that's. You know, has the piece of the dining room table in the foreground. Like left? Uh, Do you mean left? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just, I'll move everything a little bit. And move everything over a little bit. And then you could put something, uh, even when he's, even when he's still at the counter in the kitchen, you could, you could do a tighter size of what you have now behind Jane to him. You could do a tighter version of that back to him there. No. If you wanted to do one. That's almost the kind of stuff you discover, like minutes, right. minutes before shooting it. Um, what else? I mean, I'm just, I'm just seeing if we can squeeze some techniques in here. Like, for example, are there any? Holden, hand add, add, add one more camera where you have Holden standing at the at the chair right now. Put one more camera there. Um, more like in which way? No, no, not, not, not. I'm sorry, where Jane is standing now. Okay. Yeah. Put one more camera there. Looking back at Holden at the counter, a little more coverage on Holden. Now put it behind um, Holden at James. the counter, but isn't he over here at this point? Well, eventually, but I'm saying for the top part of the scene, if you wanted to have one more interim size, you back that camera up on the other side of where Jane is standing, and and you could have a size shooting Holden from that angle as well, a little bit tighter. I keep I keep picturing, and this yeah. is where I tend to go with the. There, it could be right there. Okay. You know, and so, okay. So I, I misunderstood. So this shot really has nothing to do with her. This was just a way to explain to where. Her. I'm just looking for something that happens before they gather at yeah. the table. Um, yeah. I mean, if you had these shots, you'd cut to them a lot. So why don't we just have like a shot on each of them yeah. that's nice and wide? There you go. Um, and, and maybe there is a way. I'm trying to give you some foreground. Maybe there is a way above your kitchen counter to to put, you know, s some hooks and to hang, you know, a couple of utensils or something so that when you are looking back at him, he's got a little something in the foreground, you know, or there's some decorative. You know, maybe you can find an opportunity yeah. or something there. Here I have a handoff. Um, so for when he walks back. So the camera, I mean, we got to watch our height, but basically, so the camera is going to be following his head. And then when we come down here, he's going to put something on the table and we're going to basically follow that thing down and that's going to hand off to her in the background. So that could be and, interesting. And you're, go you're going to be, Nikhil, you're going to be true to this idea. I'm just asking the question of 
by the time he lands into what would normally be over his face to her, that you have now motivated yourself somehow off of his face so that she's relatively clean without a reel over the shoulder. You're, are you committing to that? I am committing to that, Mark. I think this particular piece needs that. But I do love your note about potentially having some other not at inanimate, you know, sort of uh, foreground objects or maybe even a piece of him, just a little bit of movement of his hands to almost as a red herring, almost as a, you know, to still yeah. take them together in the same space. That's the kind of, that's the kind of, you so, know, white but we kind of did uh, design for that, and and so you would just really have to be aware of it that we designed all of these shots to have opportunities to get interesting things, like hopefully yeah. not just lampshades, but like, you know, just a little bit of his work or half chopped vegetables or a knife. And I have to say, this is where going to the actual location once it's chosen, yeah, the day before or five days before, whenever you can do it. And sitting in the environment, I get more, that's where things really start to happen. That's such a magical yeah, technique, is just walk through the scene yourself. Then you yeah. just walk through the scene and then you say, oh, I can, I can use this where it already is. Sometimes you get lucky. Or I'll just move this over here. Or I can see that I need to bring one more element in. Something that's easily to move, you know, easily movable, that I can adjust the camera and not, you know, be enslaved by but i can i can use to give me a little bit of visual interest in the shop i put in one more thing uh here i mean again i'm just spitballing so uh, nihil i mean it's important to put all this on on the right shelf first of all all this input here we completely yeah. trust that that you're gonna do what you think is right afterwards so you don't have echoes of people who disagree with your new ideas and, oh, yeah. And I mean, so, I mean, this is all yours afterwards. You can dump the whole thing. And the second part of that is that you can't really be completely blocked before you get to the set. And that means that we're just trying to get to like this 60% mark. And then, and then you're going to work out the rest when you're in a real place and maybe looking through a real lens. Um, I put in a shot here. Um, just as an idea. It feels like when they're at the table, it's kind of confrontational for a while. Um, and I thought maybe a uh, camera that's just a right angle master pushing a little bit in because that would show like a lot of gap space between them. Now, now he doesn't want to show them seated together at this point in time. Oh, you don't? Okay. Not, uh, no, right. No, that's that, that's the it. conceit. But, th but I'll tell you, the idea I think is good because you could make that a little bit tighter and maybe do a pass of the swingle that I was talking about where you're on him in profile. I didn't understand that shot, but it feel like it's, it's important. Could you, could you so, explain it again? So push, push in a little bit closer to the table. Um, I'm just going to put this off to the side because it sounds like it's the no, wrong. No, no, no. I'll, I'll make a new back. one. I'll make a new one. Okay, make a new one. <clears throat> just, get, just come right kind of a little closer to the table now. Okay. And, and basically, it pans back and forth. It can be even be a little bit closer. It can be right up against the table. And now um, it's looking at Holden, and then at certain points, it swings back over to Jane. Got it, got it. Okay. okay. Now, that's a, that's a pretty, depending how long the table is, this is where the shape of the table becomes, you know, a factor as well. Depending how lo long of a swipe that is, this might be too much. You know what I mean? But if it's a square table... And, and and the distance isn't quite so elongated, you can do a whip back and forth. But and so how does the shot work? How does it time into the scene? I, I'm not completely you, clear. A, as they sit down together and they're having this conversation, your camera operator is listening to the scene and that and he's listening, say he's on hold. You do you do one pass where you're on holding. And then when you feel like you would want to see the reaction, you whip over and you see the other person. Sometimes you just play the reaction. You do one whole pass like that, and you come back on to hold. How fast are you imagining uh, going here? Well, you know, it's easier, like, if he were to reach for something on the table, he were to reach for you the could bread follow slice, that. Yeah, yeah. you could go to his hand and then continue on up to her. So you have some motivation for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, then, and then you don't have to use every move. Then it could re it could either something she said. She takes her cigarette. She has she's either smoking or she picks up her fork. 
She looks down at something, you go down to it, or you can just go back to her. I mean, it's something you can think about. Look, at you yeah. may not have the time for this kind of money business. But, but, but I guess, so yeah, you know, whether it's like a subjective or an objective camera and like what can happen, what's motivated to like do this sort of shift from one to the other, I think that's a great thought. And I think we'll just have to play with it. Ex explore it. Now, the, the other camera we should really put in here that isn't, that's very, very important is now the revelation camera that's over where Jane would be in a wide shot back to Holden sitting in the chair all by himself. That's a very important shot. Um, and I don't know whether it has a little bit of movement on it or whether it's still, but you know, it's back over in the can't point here. Uh, it's next to the coffee table, looking back onto Holden on whatever side of the line we're on. Is, is, so is, is this the, a right about here? Wh where do you think it is? Uh, Nikhil, is it wider than that? You want to see the whole uh, room? Wider than that. So it's almost like covering the entire triangle of that. Yeah, almost the whole back of the room. Take it all the way back. So, back, back, back. So there we're you here. Go. Super wide. Yes. Yeah. yeah oh, something. my God. Okay. So the, the point is to show, I mean, so you are basically cutting on continuous action and then you're cutting wide and she doesn't exist. And because it's continuous action, it doesn't mean she just left. Exactly. That's right. That's a clarity. You idea. drop back, right? You know, if you, you drop back there, Calamity Jane, you're in, now you're in Holden's close up. You see her take the drag. You cut to Holden exhaling on the same side of the line. That's very interesting. And then, and, and while that smoke is coming, it's a long exhale. And while that smoke is coming out of his mouth, you cut back to that wide shot. So you know, no time is past you know and i would make sure that i use the sound of the breath to sort of that's good that's um, good i mean can i can you're, i can i sit a little you. more here um there's something that you could do uh i'll just i'll zoom in a little bit um this might not work uh, but uh, it's an idea um because if you had a shot that's on her and then tracks over here so it's basically it's pivoting on her so you'll see the background moving right can you imagine what this shot looks like on her so she's taking the last puff here I, do, okay. I just want to make sure you follow me so far. What this what shot you? looks like. That we're tracking from here to here. So she's almost static in the frame, but the background is moving, okay? Yeah. If we had the same shot down here on the other side of the line, um, and we're going like... Um, let's see, what, which direction is that going? That's going that direction. Um, well, if we had a shot that was like this here there's there's something a little wrong in the geography but if you had the same shot down here and then you basically just had like a lampshade or something that you're passing behind um let me let me put something in here um i always love the step of looking for a prop and then utilizing something that's labeled as something else and then calling it the other thing. <laughs> yeah. That's always, that's one. There's a story about that because... There's just enough. In the beginning, I said, well, people are going to send requests. And so we'll just do the things that people request. And nobody I'm looking for the... Nobody requests. Upgrade skin, you know? Nobody requests anything. They just <laughs> end up building stairs out of tables. I've gotten yeah. like a request for a dragon. That's it about... It. <laughs> so anyway, so... The idea would be that you have a, a shot that's moving on, on her and passes through some foreground. And if you pass through some similar foreground here on the other side, when we come out from the other side of that foreground, we're him instead. If you now, what happens on her, though? You have, you're sort of on a profile of her, of Jane sitting in the chair. What, what do you see when you dolly behind her? Are you revealing him? Um, you wouldn't make it that far back. I mean, let's you say. You wouldn't go that far back. Let's it's say. Just a, it's just a little bit of a profile move. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a profile moves. You'll see the background basically. She's with a, with a with a white. She's turning a little bit in the frame, but she's basically in the same place in the frame. And then oh. if you duplicated that here on the other side of the line, would that? It's, would, it's would, worth exploring. Uh, there is something beautifully simple about just doing this in cuts. Mm -hmm. I, th I I agree. I mean, this here is you an know, elaborate thing. You know, without adding the complication because. Because in the, in the audience's mind, the very next beat is trying to, they've got a lot to comprehend and also, in a very short amount of time. They, and you're going you to decompress up here in the corner here. Oh, my God. In that wide shot, they have to be going, what the fuck? She, oh, my God. 
Oh my God, she's not in the room. Oh, he's a crazy person. Like all these thoughts have to, you got to But can I ask, I mean, how are you intending that we see his exhale? Is that a close up or do we see the exhale over here? Oh, no, we see, we see the exhale on the close up, you know, but midway to the exhale. But are you, but are you intending to be on the other side of the line so that he, so that they're both facing the same way? That was the idea. It's something I'm going to play with. Obviously, I'm going to shoot it from both ends, and I'll play with it in the edit. Then I think that's a very interesting. Idea. I think you should think try that. to give these a shot here and see if there is a way that that's interesting. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of this. I, I think to Mark's point, the clarity is like number one priority. So yeah. anything that takes away from that would be um, would be to like would be something to keep an eye on. But but yes, absolutely. Like I, I like the idea of having some movement in here and, and to the earlier point made try to see if it ties into some kind of energy of uh, you know for that particular beat in the mm -hmm. of that particular moment in the it, scene a stylized revelation you know, look at you'll always have the cuts only version you know yeah. what i mean mm -hmm. you're doing and and i i tend to come from a less is more school of thought however this is a this is a moment that could warrant the right stylized you know, I mean, this this deserves that if you can find the one that works for you yeah. without, you know, sending you into three more days of cinematography or relighting <laughs> yeah. this. Kind of I still like this one here, the subtle push. <clears throat> we'll put it in there. I'll put it in there. Somebody else can cut it. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I feel that this is as far as it's possible to get with a blocking like this. Like you need to be on a set and, and feel it out in order to really make any more progress with this here. I, I, I agree. I have a question for Mark. Um, so I was, you know, watching uh, NCIS, the, uh, the ending shots that sort of shift into black and white, was that a conceit? What? How was that conceit arrived? Conceit arrived? Well, That's interesting, another interesting you should ask. <laughs> so the uh, creator of the, of, the, of the series, a man named Don Belisario, mm -hmm. who also created the television series JAG, he created Magnum PI, uh, and, uh, he created Quantum Leap. He's a, he's a very successful uh, uh, showrunner and show creator of shows that that uh stayed on the air a long time yeah yeah you know what i mean he, he had quite a he had quite a track record so he had this idea the fr we had been shooting jag and jag ncis was a spin-off of the jag series and 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 jag was shot in a very traditional almost like a 40s movie style um you know we we had a full 30 piece orchestra for the score. All the moves were sort of very classical. You know, we did a lot of dolling, stuff like that. By the time he got to NCIS, he wanted to do something that almost looked like a rock video. And mm -hmm. so we, so what, what we infused so that it looked completely different than Jag. That was his point. And, and, and we did a lot of this shooting two and three cameras at the same time, crossing the line all the time. Um, uh, and we literally almost shot it for the first couple of years, like a rock video, where the where the actors wouldn't even know where the get the camera was. There were just cameras suddenly popping up everywhere. And uh, and we if we got seventy five or eighty percent of something right, we'd say great, flip the lenses, let's go again. Three more cameras, three different lenses, but, and we would shoot these seventy two page scripts with just endless amounts of coverage. One of the stylistic devices that he wanted to end each act with was something that he referred to as bang, bang, bang. And if you watch the first year, maybe even the second year, every act would end with a high down shot that would be, could be outside, that would start with a high down shot that then would go one more size bigger and one more size bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality of doing that when you're in Los Angeles shooting for D.C., was that you started seeing a lot of things you didn't want to see and that and that you'd have to now uh, uh, not use a certain location because the damn end of the bang, bang, bang didn't work. You know, suddenly you revealed that there was parking lots all around or, you know, you yeah. saw palm trees everywhere or that you'd have to do some kind of mat shot. Plus, the time that it took for us to 
almost have to bring in a second unit and a giant 150 foot you know cherry picker to get the camera up high enough this is before drones and all those things were you know this is sure. 18 years ago now 20 years ago um it became a logistical nightmare and i begged him i said don look you got to come up with some other device to end your act you got to do something that we can do in post-production that's easy uh you know that gives you this sort of button to the end of the act and so then he came up with this concept as as something that we could do easily at revealing what is in fact the beginning of the act is is technically a freeze frame of what you're going to see at the end of the act that was that was the idea unless the caveat is unless it reveals too much unless it really shows you the ending that you don't want to reveal and then we show you something that happened just before that beat so that's the genesis that's the long version genesis of how we got it's interesting what <laughs> drove that that's amazing thank you thank you for sharing sure so this was super cool um we we did some good work i want to stress Nikhil, that this is still all yours meaning that it's just that we're like for example when i get some input and then i feel like now i now i have to honor that input you can you can burn all this if you want and and go Completely. in a different. so the point is that you can just still think on your feet and and uh, so we're we're not ghosts in your head telling you how to feel about this um, I mean, but, as you, but I think this was useful. I mean, we 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 massaged some subtext out of the out of the story here, and and this yes. is the work that you have to do for a scene because you you you've got nothing to work with for blocking a scene if if you have no idea what's happening inside of it. This was great. Yeah, this is terrific. yeah. And as we we're just talking about the example of how that you know ending came about because of constraints i'm sure you know i'm gonna have to like manage on location and but oh, there's no doubt about it this is <laughs> no this is fairly complicated this now it is an important scene in your movie yeah. so it's something that's worth prioritizing yeah. you know yeah. uh, and and we do this all the time you know we, we call it the the rule of thirds it's, you know uh, a third of your show you're going to really concentrate on you're going to get all the coverage that you need you're going to get all the shots you're going to really work on the performance a third of it you're going to kind of have to move through you know at a fairly reasonable place and a third of it you're going to have to go like hell that's sort of the you know yeah. um shooting features in the morning and we're shooting documentaries by the afternoon you know is something that uh, yeah. we still <laughs> sort of deal with yeah. on, a, on a daily basis and i say that these are very experienced directors and people that have been doing this for many many years have shot hundreds thousands of hours of television still suffer and really go through all of the same machinations that we're talking about here. But I do have to say that the exploration <clears throat> of the motivation and the emotion and how that physicalizes itself, get, getting that right, at least getting the bones of that dance feeling to give you some focus and direction and give you something to express to your actors and have them work on. As you can see, once you get that down, Figuring out where the shots are isn't that tough. Yeah. You know what I mean? It will tell you where the shots are. And I would add one more note is that, um, and it's very quickly because my babysitter is leaving <laughs> and, and my wife is traveling. So I'm, I'm on deck like right about now. I go. Um, but um, I, I, really th I, I really think you found some terrific pictures in like the storyboard-ish type thing that you created. And... When you block from above in a diagram, you tend to suck. You tend to suck all the passion out of it and and all the magic out of it. And I would anchor the scene around these kinds of framings. This I feel like this scene here is very framing driven, and it's less about where the cameras physically are. So I think you had a great intuition with picking these uh, images here, and I think you should uh, that that should be your anchor for the scene. This de this device I think is a very good one. This would be something I would share with my DP. Uh, you know, even more, even as, I mean, my DP looks at my diagrams and he knows what things mean, but to show these kinds of pictures of examples of things, you know, it just ends a lot of chit chat very quickly. It really and does. This is the mood. This is the mood that we're looking for. Oh, okay. Well, I know how to get there, you know, or, or now you start the process. How, yeah. how are we going to get there? How will I control the light in an apartment that's 14 stories up? You know I mean? Yeah, but it's all, it's all there. So yeah. we did the work. Uh, yes. 
Go ahead. Thank you, guys. I just want to say thank you to you so, so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, thank you, Per, for putting this together. This yeah, is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Truly. Mark's a cool guy. Yeah. It was my pleasure. I wish you the best of luck. This is very very exciting I'm, as you can see i'm it was an exciting thing to uh <laughs> to work on and i and i wish you uh, all the best uh, thank you. Uh, in, in, thank you. in filling it thank you guys so i really hope you thought that was interesting leave a comment if you have a question about the episode and remember to subscribe or follow to get notified of new episodes and i'll see you soon